Hello, BookTube. I have a tag for you on this Tag Tuesday. I just saw it on Jason Harrigan's channel, Byways in Bookland. It's, it's the uh, supermarket shopping book tag. And Jason's premise is that he was in line at the supermarket and thought that the, the fodder of the daily, the weekly or the bi-weekly or the monthly ritual of the supermarket shop up would be a great uh, skeleton on which to drape a book tag. And of course, in doing that, he pulls at unexpected nostalgia heartstrings for a lot of people, at least for me, because I haven't been to a supermarket in months, <laughs> months, uh, in the terms of the, the, the operatically enormous, uh, for instance, Western American UK version where it's a city and it's got enough provender in it to last forever and has an endless amount of variety. Instead, I, for the last three months, uh, March, April, May, yeah, for the last three months, I have made do with local shops around here, right in this area. Walking distance, I haven't been on the subway, I haven't been into Boston proper in all that time. Incredible. This is longer that I have been outside that I have not visited Boston than I've ever done in my life when I was living in the country. <laughs> uh, and I remember <laughs> what supermarkets were like. You could get anything, anything that you wanted. Uh, anything you had a yen for, anything you wanted to try. And that's not true, of course, with local markets, the, the local little markets. With them, you don't have the choice at all. You, you adapt to what they get. Uh, and there is a positive. I always like to look for positives in any kind of life change if I can. And the positive, of course, with, with local markets is that you get to know the people, get to know the people who are running it. That's been wonderful. I will, if supermarkets ever go back to normal, I will miss that. I, I don't imagine, I imagine that, that if things were to go back to some version of normal, I don't think they ever will, but if they did, I can easily imagine that my routines would change as well, that I would, I would go from going to the shops up the street every other day or so to going to the supermarket once a week and just not go to the shops up the street. And I would miss that. Uh, but anyway, uh, he, I, Jason itemizes. His, his tag along all the different uh, the, all the different stations of the cross that you do at a supermarket. And I thought it was a lot of fun. So I saw the tag and immediately wanted to do it. And the first one is exactly the kind of nosy personal question that I myself love. If I made it a new tag, I would make, it would be another tag that was just full of nosy questions like this. Although really, this whole tag is a nosy question. I hope that you will all do it that way because I wanna know your routines, your rituals, not only what they used to be, but what they are now. In, in our new COVID reality, if it's changed and how it's changed. Uh, but the first one is explicitly nosy. It's uh, the list. Before going book shopping, including virtually and online, do you make a list? Such a great question. And uh, Jason mentions in his own answer that he doesn't have a fixed list, but he has kind of a, a card catalog, a Rolodex in his mind of things that's always changing and that's always the, the kind of thing where uh, if you see it, you'll know it. <laughs> if you see something that you've been looking for, you don't have to go in with that as a mental list in the front of your mind for it to ping. And I, I am like that. I have that. I think every every book person has that kind of a list. I have a, a tiny, tiny list of a couple of actual specific items that I might want. And that changes from visit to visit because I will stop wanting them or I will find them somewhere. Uh, but largely, what I like is what he mentions in his own answer, which is the serendipity of the hunt. Finding something that you didn't know you wanted, or that you didn't know you were specifically in the mood for. And then all of a sudden you see it and the tumblers click. I love that feeling. Absolutely love it. And as some of you longtime viewers of this channel will know, uh, there is a used bookstore in Boston called the Brattle Bookshop. Uh, that is it just, it's a normal, really good used bookstore, but the outside lot is full of thousands of regularly rotated sale books. One dollar, three dollar, and five dollar in no order. So that you have to just prowl through them and they are uploaded and uh, uh, rooted over and pulled apart and put back, not only by the staff, but by the customers every day. Now that's not true. The brattle carts have been, have been tarped over and closed during this pandemic. I have to hope that someday they won't be. <sighs> uh, and I accustomed my my list to the serendipity of those carts. The, one, of the, one of the main rules about the Brattle carts that I learned over decades of going there was you can't bring 
specific demands to the card. If you do, not only will you not find that demand, you won't find anything that you want. The gods that guard the cards are very careful about that sort of thing. So you have to go with the flow of the battle cards. So you see something and say, huh, well, that's I haven't thought of that in a long time. That's kind of interesting. And then two cards later, a hundred books later, you'll see something else that kind of sort of complements that first thing and you go back and you get it and you take that second thing and you realize the cards are building a list for you. So that's the type of list that I tend to, to gravitate towards more than, oh, I'm looking for this one particular thing, I must go into every bookshop and look for it. Uh, that seems a very arid way for me to look for books. Uh, uh, prompt number two is fruit and vegetables. <laughs> uh, good for the body and the mind. Uh, recommend a book you felt in, improved your physical or mental health. And uh, my answer is a little bit off the mark. I don't think that I have ever had my physical or mental health explicitly improved by the contents of a book. I don't believe that that's ever happened. I can't imagine a way in which it would. But I can think of something adjacent, something close, something that is where the book was full of practical information that not only made me think, uh, but that made me think also about the practical applications in my own home. And that is a book called Home Comforts by Cheryl Mendelson. I think I've mentioned it on this channel before. It is a strange, weird, and wonderful book. It is bottomless. So, and it's about all kinds of things from keeping your surfaces mite and uh, insect free to uh, keeping your bedding clean and, and refreshed and key, or, or ways to improve, organize, uh, clean your books, organize a bookcase, organize shelf space that isn't for books, organize your storage space in a bathroom or a kitchen. Stuff that you wouldn't think would be all that interesting, but Cheryl Mendelson makes it interesting. It's an incredible book. It's a little bit disturbing. <laughs> she doesn't pull any punches about the ugly realities of any house or your own body. <laughs> she, she tells you very explicitly how much liquid your body sweats per night. In other words, that's absorbed by your clothing or your bed covers or both. She goes into detail about what lives in your pillowcases, what lives on your eyelashes, what lives on your bookcases that seem clean to you. Uh, but the price you pay for that kind of uncomfortableness is a huge amount of learning about the places where you live. So I think that would that, that kind of counts for this prompt. Uh, then uh, prompt number three is tinned goods. Uh, regardless of the label on the can, the contents are all, all too often bland. What is your tin can genre? I love that. Uh, and it, it bespeaks a little bit of maybe uh, a UK way to look at things. Uh, because the one thing you can't call, in America, we would, for instance, would call tin, tinned goods canned goods. And canned goods in America, quite a few of them, are not bland because they are 90% salt. <laughs> so they're terrible for you, but you can't say they don't, they don't have a zest when you eat them. It's just you shouldn't do it because it's all salt. Or you should limit it. A can of, of Campbell's soup every now and again is necessary for staying regular. <laughs> but still, uh, I get the point here. And uh, the for me... Jason's answers and mine are often at odds with each other in the course of doing this tag. For instance, he, he has some favorable things to say about the genre that for me would be the tin can genre, and that is self-help or self-improvement. He mentions in his own answers to his video, since I'm mentioning it so much, of course I'll link to it anyway because it's the origin of this tag, he mentions that a lot of these books can be very vigorous to read even though what they're retailing is basically common sense and for me I would shift the emphasis of that statement I don't disagree with the statement at all but I would shift the emphasis to because this is all basically common sense these books are mind-numbingly dull they're they're incredibly bland except when they infuriate because nine times out of ten they're they are retailing flat nose on your face common sense in order to grift customers in order to to siphon money out of people who think they need that kind of common sense. Uh, so that that is a, a genre for me. I have almost never read a, a, an example of a self-help book that interested me in the slightest. I have to read a lot of them. I review a lot of them, but they, they are just, to me, an endless regurgitation of the same basic ten points. With, uh, and when when the, the key thing, when it's obvious to me that the key point for the author of those books 
happens before you read any of those books. They, they all say, well, what I'm really stressing is this, or, or clean your room, or, you know, minimize, or it has to spark joy, or anything like that. They, in the book, they stress that that's their main point, but their main point happens long before those main points are ever written on the page, which is that you're paying for it. That's the main thing they care about, is that they've somehow conned you into paying $25 to be told that you should maintain an, an optimistic attitude. <laughs> so, so for me, it would be self-help. Uh, then uh, prompt number four is the meat or fish counter prepared by a skilled butcher or fishmonger. Uh, just how you want it. Tells us about, tell us about a book you felt was written just for you. Uh, <laughs> this question also betrays that Jason has perhaps not spent a whole lot of time at a meat counter of an American supermarket. <laughs> prepared just how you like it. Good luck with that. <laughs> but, uh, but I know, again, I know what you mean. And I do have an example. I wanted to do to do prompts here because so you weren't just staring at my bulbous nose the whole time but I cannot find my copy of this book I know that I still have it it must be somewhere but it, but I, I cannot find it but I mentioned it on this channel before it's my life in dog years by Gary Paulson who is a, also a, a fairly good YA novelist he did a book he did he did a memoir he's done a couple of nonfiction he did a really good nonfiction book on the Iditarod a doomed uh, sporting event that, that uh, once upon a time was the hallmark of the sporting event mega endurance but it requires arctic weather it requires arctic it, it's a snow it's a snow sled race if you don't have vast tundras of open snow you cannot have the iditarod so unless you have a wheel i guess you could put wheels on the sleds and have the dogs pull it that way but then the dogs would be in severe danger of heat of heat stroke so but anyway Gary Paulson wrote a book called My Life in Dog Years, which is a, it's a very thin thing, and it basically goes through his life dog by dog. Not Maybe not all the dogs, but the, the signpost ones. Those of you who've had multiple dogs will know there are, there are signpost dogs. They, it's a, it seems like a heartless thing to say. You, you obviously automatically want to say, all my dogs are incredibly special to me, and they all are. They all are. But there are signpost dogs. There are ones that would be chapters of their own. You might even say there are ones you love more than others. I know that that is that is heresy in the dog in the dog world. It's a, a slight echo of the much greater heresy in the human parenting world. <laughs> I've never met a human parent who didn't repeat that rather obvious lie <laughs> that I love all my children exactly the same. I, as, if, as if when you become a parent, you cease being a person. You cease being a human being. Humans develop preferences. It doesn't mean you wouldn't do anything. But it doesn't mean you wouldn't lay down on a train track for your children. But obviously, no parent in the history of the world has ever loved all their children exactly the same, to the same amount. What, what little children always suspect is absolutely true. Your parents do have favorites. <laughs> they, the key is that if you're a good parent, you won't act it. You won't. You won't. You won't penalize anyone for not being your favorite. <laughs> I got all the parents. I oh, I don't know. I might have all the parents listening to me saying, "Oh no, you're completely wrong. I love all my children exactly the same." But I'd be willing to bet that those same parents, were I to were I to get a couple of glasses of wine inside them, might say something different. Uh, but it doesn't matter because it's just human nature. If it's an ineluctable fact of human nature, then I don't need a poll. Uh, and the same thing is kind of sort of true with dog people, and Gary Paulson never comes out and says it. But he's owned many more dogs than are present in my life in dog years. These are the signpost ones. These are the ones that really change you, that change your world one way or another. I've had them myself. Many of them. I've had one of them on this channel. <laughs> While I, In just the time we've known each other. My little basset hound... Uh, Actually, not very little. <laughs> Lucy wasn't actually very little. And she didn't care about me at all. Until she was very, very old, she barely even noticed that I was there, except as someone to yell at and complain about and fart on. Uh, but you that doesn't matter. You can't tell what the signpost dog will be. You don't you don't know who it will be. And there was one right before her, too, before I started book two. Um, and they're the ones who change you. They're the ones who deepen you as a person. And uh, whether they love you back or not it doesn't doesn't really matter uh and th so in terms of a book that felt like it was written just for me yeah my life in dog years felt like it was written just for me uh then we move on to prompt number five that is baked goods bread is a staple for many around the world who is an author you can easily digest at any time of day and here i do have a prompt and it's this it's samuel peeps uh who wrote uh, a diary kept a diary for 10 years 
of just his ordinary days. Went here, had lunch with so-and-so, had breakfast with so-and-so, trying to be better about not getting blindingly drunk every night, tried to get up early, see what it was like, uh, saw an eclipse, saw a Shakespeare play, belted my wife across the face and was belted back in return. <laughs> uh, tried to make a profit, made an excellent profit. I'm worried about uh, a friend, he has a wasting disease, he looks worse every time I see him, that sort of thing. Just, just day after day after day after day after day for 10 years of quotidian stuff, all written with an, a boundless amount of fascination. No literary merit, but Pepys is, is actively, enjoyably living his life, and that is wonderful. It's wonderful to read, and I can take it at any time. Uh, because as uh, Thomas Mallon, the novelist and the nonfiction writer Thomas Mallon, wrote a book about personal diaries, of course, he includes a lot. He writes a lot about uh, Samuel Pepys in that book. But in that book, when he's talking about keeping a personal journal, he makes a very good point when he says that nothing, in fact, never happens. <laughs> it's never true that nothing happens. Plenty of stuff happens all the time. It's not a question of the events, it's a question of the narrator. Uh, so I can, I can deal with Pepys at any time, and I know that for a fact because I've taken him everywhere. And I have gone to him when nothing else would work, when my heart was broken. I have gone to him when I was uh, uh, in, in utter despair over some technical or personal thing that wasn't emotional, that was just, this is a rotten turn of events, this is going to be a drastic inconvenience for a long time. Even then, Peeps has been through it. So it, it, he works. He works in all seasons. Uh, then uh, prompt number six is chilled section. Uh, the frozen foods, for those of you in America. Recommend a cool new author or book you recently discovered. I have a prompt for this as well because I loved it. Absolutely loved it. I think we've seen it on this channel. It's Maggie Doherty's book, The Equivalents. Uh, let me read you just a bit here, just in case those of you missed it. In 1960, Harvard's sister college, Radcliffe, announced the founding of an Institute for Independent Study, a, quote, messy experiment in women's education that offered paid fellowships to those with a PhD or the equivalent in artistic achievement. So in other words, it was an open call to people who didn't have a PhD but were promising artists in their own right. Coming during an era when women were expected to focus on raising families, the opportunity was unprecedented and life-changing. It was Virginia Woolf's call for money and a room of her own brought to life. Thousands of women applied from across the country. Five of the women who received the fellowships, the poets Anne Sexton and Maxine Kuhnman, Painter Barbara Swan, sculptor Mariana Pineda, and writer Tilly Olson quickly formed deep bonds with one another, exchanging ideas and art, forging friendships that would la inspire and sustain their most ambitious work for the rest of their lives. They called themselves the equivalents. And I don't know what I was expecting from this book. I don't think I've ever read this author before, but this was terrific. Absolutely terrific. Just so incredibly spirited. And every everywhere you turn, every time you turn around in the book, the author... Maggie Doherty goes from talking about these five women and all the women in their orbit and all the men in their orbit. She goes from talking about them to reflecting on what art is just in general. And those are as, every bit as enjoyable as the personal character, the personal traits of her cast of characters. Just an amazing book, full of wonder. So that counts as a cool new, uh, a new author. Uh, <clears throat> Prompt number seven is the frozen section. Oh, Oh, so the chilled section is different? I don't think they have a chilled section in American supermarkets. Nothing in America is chill. It's a rather exhausting country to live in. It makes one pine for the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, the frozen section. Tell us about a book that gave you shivers. Uh, and I, I, I've lamented on this channel before that this this kind of a, of a question doesn't really apply to me, whether it's books or, oh God, specifically horror movies. I have been to horror movies so many times with cinema aficionados, horror movie aficionados, and I, they, they don't work on me. Whatever, uh, whatever switch I'm supposed to have in my mind is permanently switched off because I, I don't get scared by such things. They just don't frighten me at all. They, I know that they're trying to, and I know there's an art involved in that, but it just, it just doesn't work. Uh, and the same thing is largely true with books as well. I don't get the shivers from them. I don't hear a, you know, a bare branch scratching on a window pane and suddenly fear the worst. Um, but there are some books where I've noticed that the artistry was really good and where I came close. <laughs> I want to name a novel and a short story. I've mentioned both of them on this channel before. The novel is The Light at the End by Skip and Spectre. It's a collaborative novel about urban vampires that is very effective. I, it didn't, didn't make me shiver, but it, it, did, it made me think, okay, this will work on just about anybody. And the short story is by George R. R. Martin, the author of the unfinished 
uh, Song of Ice and Fire, uh, who is and thereby because of that and its spinoff books and now equated in the minds of a million readers with epic high fantasy, with these and thous and, and vaguely medieval formations and dragons and whatnot. Uh, but he wrote, spent a whole career writing science fiction, fantasy, and horror short stories. And one of his short stories was called Sand Kings, about a man who makes an interesting uh, novelty purchase that takes over his life. And it is an amazing short story. It is amazingly done. Uh, right up to the conclusion, which is, the conclusion is amazing. Sand Kings was was the title story in a, an old timescape George R. R. Martin collection that I wish I still had uh, of short stories. It's, it's often reprinted by him. Uh, so... It works. It works for me. Whereas it doesn't always work, even for the same author. George R. R. Martin wrote a vampire novel set in, in uh, 19th century America called Fever Dream. This is very effective as a novel, very, very good as a version of vampires, but it isn't scary at all. I, mean, I think it was clearly meant to be. Uh, so I'm going to include those two, Light at the End and Sand Kings. Uh, then number eight, prompt number eight is Beer, Wine, and Spirits. In my own supermarket, you have to go up a flight of stairs to get to that section. And... You can find lots of great stuff. The, the most knowledgeable guy in the whole building is in that section. And you can also find absolute steals. <laughs> when I Back in the old days when I had regular, regular hoot nannies here at the Hyde Cottage where I would have writers and editors come over, I, and I knew that they were going to... The, the main thing they're drunk on, writers and editors, is the sound of their own voice, but they're still going to want some wine. And I would go there because you can get enough to... to immobilize a herd of elephants for very little money. <laughs> so, uh, Name one of the first books you read that made you feel like an adult. I'm afraid I have never felt like an adult, so I no, no book has ever done the trick. <laughs> I have to punt on this, even though it's one of my favorite sections of the supermarket. <laughs> so let's just move on to prop number nine, sweets and candy. The sweets and candy aisle is where you will find the mega stuff Oreos that I pine for. In fact, uh, I, know, I know that Owners of little local shops don't like you to. I mean, they'll be nice about it, but they don't like you to ask if they can if they can get something for you specifically. They don't really like you to do that because they, unless it's fifty of you, they're not going to do it. it. All it's going to do is make them feel uncomfortable, make you feel uncomfortable. And the the shops that I the local shops that I go to do not have mega stuff Oreos, and it's the only thing from the supermarket that I incredibly miss <laughs> i so much miss my mega stuff oreos i so much miss them one of the local shops a little bit distant has double stuff oreos but once you've had mega stuff oreos you don't go back to double stuff Oreos. you barely notice the stuff if you do <sighs> that's what i miss most of all about the supermarket is mega stuff oreos <laughs> uh but anyway the prompt is what genre or author is your indulgence when you need a little treat read uh, and I have it, and you're going to know what it is ahead of time. I have a prompt for you, but it's one of many. It's old-style Signet Regency romances. This is The Reluctant Bride. Look at that cover. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, and, and you know, you, you purists among you, I'd rather not hear that, yes, the light is coming from two different sources, two different places on the cover. Okay? Not everyone's examining this down to its joists and nut bolts. It's just, I love these old Signet Regency romances. They're full of the sparkle of wit and conversation. They don't have any uh, raunchy sex elements. They don't have any, usually any darker elements at all. There's an element of play in them that I absolutely love. They work for me for all seasons. I wish that I had a lot more of them. I have a bookcase right here. I often show it on these videos. Uh, see? See that? It's just, it's tons of Regency romances. But you'll notice, for instance, the front row of this shelf is not all regions. There are regencies in the back. These are double stacked, but the front row is not. And you'll see there are a couple here that aren't regency romances. And that is a defect that I would like to correct. <laughs> I would like to fill this, this whole bookcase with old style signet regency romances. But with a quarantine in place with, with, with big venues like the Five Colleges book sale or anything like the, all the charity shops where I would use to get these things with all of them closed down, that's become impossible to do. So I, I can't. <laughs> I've, 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 once upon a time, when you were all going out and about, instead of hunkering down in your homes, I used to ask you, take pictures at your local used bookstore. If you find a batch of Regency romances, buy them all and send them to me and I'll reimburse you. And also take pictures of everything else. And also some of you, occasionally, maybe, there's a, maybe there's a box or a bookcase up in the attic that's full of old romances. 
that maybe your mother bought once upon a time, she doesn't look at them anymore, or you don't want them. I, I would very much like pictures like that, but I don't want to send anybody to the post office during quarantine either. So, so I'm stuck with the roughly 300 Regency romances that I have right now. And they're, fortunately, they're great to reread because they are the exact equivalent of uh, the old style 150-page uh, murder mystery novels where the buyer doesn't remember what they've read. <laughs> the perfect equivalent of that. So they'll do for now until I can replenish the stock. Uh, then uh, prompt number 10 is the magazine stand. If you read magazines or journals, regularly share some titles with us. Uh, and I do. I noticed that in Jason's, in Jason's own video, he shared magazines and journals that I doubt very much he sees at his supermarket magazine stand. Uh, but the same would be true for me as well. You've seen a lot of them on this channel. There's National Geographic. There's The New Yorker. Harper's. Atlantic. There's the London Review of Books. The New York Review of Books. There's the New York Times Book Review, which I usually have to get the Sunday New York Times to read. Uh, there's the TLS. Um, what else? What am I leaving out? Birds and Blooms, uh, Architectural Digest. Um, I mentioned National Geographic. National Geographic and The New Yorker are the main ones that aren't explicitly literary. There are all sorts of, of, uh, of like the Weekly Review or the Weekly Standard or stuff like that. M political magazines that have a back of the book section that's full of book reviews. Those are, are spottier now. I, those were impulse buys when I went to bookstores, and I don't go to bookstores anymore, so they, they are I'm much less often. I think about them. My, my actual subscriptions to them have long since lapsed to those political things because there just isn't enough bang for the buck for me to get an issue of the National Review or something like that and have half the magazine be stuff that is either ill-informed or infuriating. <laughs> you know, because the... the, 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 the Boston Irish Catholic in me wants to read every page of a magazine I pay good money for. And the only healthy approach to those political magazines is to not do that. It's to just explicitly tear them in half as soon as you get them and read only the back half. And I just can't, I've never been really comfortable doing that. So I've, those have largely lapsed. It's mainly the literary things that still keep coming. Uh, until, again, until everything is back to normal. When, like, for instance, uh, the Squarebound science fiction anthologies that I love so much, fantasy and science fiction, Asimov's and Analog, I would love to have a subscription to those, so those were coming in the mail. I used to buy them in, in a bookstore, and so I've been without them for three months. Uh, w if things go back to normal, I will re-up all the subscriptions that I need uh, to make sure that they keep coming. Uh, and that is it. That leads us to the final prompt, checkout. Uh, time to go home and unpack, tag some shoppers on your way, on their way in. And I have a list of people I want to tag here. I want to tag, uh, Sean D. Stanfast, um, uh, Roz at Scally Dandling about the books. I love tagging her. Uh, Scott at Shelfware, a brand new booktuber, but I just, so I don't know if he's, if, how many tags he's done, but I'm, I'm happy to tag him on this one. Uh, Amy at Zoe Beck, uh, and Sarah at Steeped in Books, my sister from another mister, my cousin on booktube. And keep in, oh, and of course Britta. <laughs> can't leave Britta out of a tag now can we she has so few tags to do <laughs> and keep in mind when you do this I don't just want your book answers okay I also want to know about your shopping <laughs> I want to explicitly nose my way into your personal life I want to know what you do have you do have you stopped going to your usual grocery store are you, do you have to go in uh, is there somebody at the door let be only six people in at a time is there a special hour that you go, or a special time of day, all of that stuff, all of the quarantine stories, and also all the older stories. What, what, did it, what did it used to be like? How often did you go? How long did you spend there? How many indulgence items did you do? All that sort of nosy stuff as well. Jason's too nice to poke around in your personal life, but I'm not. <laughs> so, so feel free. Consider yourself tagged. Uh, and I will, I will wrap this up for now. This tag has gone long, and I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.